is probably of interest to uh, most of us who live in northern New England and any other climate where um, staying warm in winter is sometimes challenging. Uh, and so we will talk about how to approach insulating and ventilating historic houses in ways that are uh, respectful of the historic character and fabric of the house and uh, that give us the advantages we want without doing damage to materials uh, that are historically significant. And uh, so here's the same house you saw in the first photo, shortly after a delivery of insulation that was going under the house, in this case, uh, as part of a radiant floor heating system. Um, and let's start by just talking about the sustainability of historic houses, because these houses were built at a time when the materials were local, the labor was local, and the carbon footprint, to use the contemporary term, uh, to build these houses was really small. And looking at Witten House, which is the house that was in the introductory slides, uh, it is located here in Topsom, Maine. Uh, the granite quarry for the foundation, the brickyard for the chimneys, the sawmills and shingle mills and sash and door mills and the blacksmith shop that contributed to the construction of the house were all located within a quarter of a mile down on the falls of the Androscoggin. The wood that was used in the house was cut upriver and moved by water power to the mills. The lime for the mortar and plaster likely came from Rockport, Maine by sailing ship in 1827. And the glass was probably manufactured either in Portland or Boston, and again, brought here by a sailing ship. So very little uh, carbon was involved in the creation of this house. And that embodied energy has real value for our environment. And compared to the building materials for a comparable modern house, the carbon footprint for this house is tiny. Um, modern houses are put together from pieces manufactured all over the globe, often of materials with a very high uh, environmental um, footprint in their fabrication, particularly uh, the polyvinyl chlorides and, and other products derived from petroleum. You know, these are products that are, are doing bad things to our environment long before they arrive to be installed. Um, so when we're looking at issues of sus sustainability, and efficiency in the context of a historic house, that house is starting with such a large lead on a comparable modern house that you can be less efficient than a modern house and still be winning the race for what, which is the more sustainable building. So that's a, an important context to keep in mind when we're talking about this subject. Now, if my slide will advance, there we go. So where we wanna start is looking at what are the current conditions of the house that you're dealing with. And a great way to get a lot of very useful information for this is to have an energy auditor come in and do an energy audit. Um, ideally, someone who works independently, not for a particular contractor who's they're going to try to feed work to, but just someone whose job is to independently look at your house and go through the steps to determine where its energy issues are and then recommend what 
the right solutions are. So a good energy audit should include thermal imaging of the exterior of the house, um, which will show exactly where heat transfer is happening more or less. Um, so you can identify where insulation and air sealing are most needed. A blower door test to measure the air infiltration. Identification of moisture problems and the recommendations to address them. Uh, you, it's really uh, not recommended that you tighten up and insulate a house if it still has a lot of moisture coming into it because you'll trap that moisture and it will do damage. It can create toxic mold. Um, there are just lots of reasons why you have to address the moisture before you tighten up the house. Uh, the energy audit will document the existing HVAC equipment, analyze its energy efficiency and costs, and, uh, and then make recommendations for potential improvements in that area. Same with hot water, if that's separate from the HVAC and lighting. Um, <clears throat> and a, a thorough energy audit will also uh, give you approximate costs for the recommendations that they are including and tell you what the potential savings are to be realized from the different recommendations. So an energy audit is worth every penny uh, of investment to understand where you'll get the most bang for your buck in making improvements uh, to insulation uh, as well as HVAC equipment. And for some reason, this isn't advancing easily. Um, <clears throat> so you, once you have that information, you can prioritize what the improvements are for both cost uh, comfort and cost effectiveness. And there are sort of four or five components of tackling this issue. One is, as I mentioned, stop the moisture infiltration and ventilate the house. Um, as they exist, uh, many historic houses without insulation uh, or storm windows are very well ventilated. Um, that's why they cost so much to heat and they're often cold even when they cost so much to heat. Um, uh, an uninsulated historic house <clears throat> will have a lot of air exchange going on. When that gets tightened up, efforts have to be made to introduce ventilation to replace enough of that air exchange to keep a healthy environment within the house. <clears throat> sealing the cracks. Air sealing is absolutely critical to a comfortable and efficient house. And that's from the foundation to the eaves. Uh, you want to keep the cold air out and let the, uh, keep the, yeah, and keep the hot air in. And air sealing is critical to that. Then we talk about insulation and most importantly, the cap of the house because heat rises and most heat loss in any building is going right through the roof. <clears throat> and then beyond that, there are additional areas to look at, but always start with the cap. That's where you will absolutely get the most bang for your buck. Tightening up doors and windows is equally important, uh, particularly uh, if you've got old windows that have not been rehabbed or well-maintained. Uh, there can be a lot of air loss through them and doors without weather stripping, the same. Uh, a 16th of an inch gap all the way around a standard door is the equivalent of a 12 inch square hole in the wall. So little gaps and little cracks can add up to substantial area for heat to move right out through. And then finally, improvements to heating and cooling equipment 
can make a significant difference in both the comfort of the house and the cost to keep it that way. So today we're going to focus on the insulation and ventilation parts of this, but these other elements absolutely play into it and need to be considered as well. So as I said, starting point, stop the moisture infiltration. If you have a dirt floor in your basement or crawl space, it needs to be sealed with a heavy plastic vapor barrier. And if there's still moisture getting in, a uh, dehumidifier connected to a sump pump or other drain to the outside is absolutely essential because all of that moisture under the house will make its way up into the house and ultimately uh, it's got to get back out somewhere. And if you can just stop it from getting in in the first place, you will have a much better time um, or you'll need less effort to deal with ventilating up above. Back plastering is an excellent form of air sealing. This was a traditional practice here in Northern New England from at least the early 19th century into the later 19th century. Uh, and I believe I've also seen evidence of it in 18th century houses. Essentially, when a house was framed and sheathed on the exterior, the plasterers would come in and plaster the back side of the exterior sheathing which is what you're seeing here in an attic. And then the lath would be applied to the interior side of the studs and the interior plaster would be installed. So that exterior surface on the back of the sheathing boards was completely sealed with a layer of lime plaster. Um, and then the air gap between that and the finished plaster on the interior was narrowed and the, the less depth there is in a gap, the more stable the air is in it. It's not circulating, which provides more insulating value. So a back plastered wall uh, is really very effective at keeping drafts out and providing some level of insulation in the wall assembly. On the exterior, uh, caulking is your friend. Um, anywhere that air can get in, particularly where trim meets siding or pieces of siding meet each other, um, along the top of the foundation, between foundations of uh, stones, um, where pipes uh, or electrical cables penetrate the walls, anywhere there is an opening, sealing it up on the exterior and on the interior is essential to reducing air infiltration. And air infiltration can cause more uh, loss of heat and more discomfort in the form of drafts than lack of insulation. So I keep referring to moisture and it's because it, it is a, an element of modern life through activities such as showers and laundry and cooking uh, that is putting more moisture into these houses than they likely had on a regular basis historically. Uh, particularly daily showers for a family of four or six people, um, that level of moisture just was not produced in a house historically. So if you've sealed up your house and you're trying to insulate it, you don't want that moisture moving into the insulation and getting it wet which reduces its efficiency, or getting trapped in that wall assembly and moving the dew point into the wall, particularly for a masonry building. Because when 
that dew point moves into the wall as opposed to the outer surface or the inner surface, that moisture can condense into water and lead to real uh, issues with uh, structure and, and potentially mold and, and other nasty stuff within your walls. So it becomes important to get the moisture back out as you tighten up a house. And one way to do that is through ventilating your roof uh, with eave vents and roof vents um, or gable end vents. Um, depending on where your insulation goes, there are different ways to approach this. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Mechanical ventilation is also really important. Um, if you're dealing with a mid-century, mid-20th century house, um, you may have existing vintage ventilation equipment, which works fine and keep using it. <laughs> and luckily it's from a period where things were made to be repairable. Um, so, you know, this wonderful Westinghouse ventilation fan is in a uh, 1957 bathroom and is still doing the job it was intended to do perfectly well in 2021. Um, you can also do ventilation in ceilings and then use uh, a, a Victorian looking uh, vent cover like this cast piece that is connected to a modern bath vent. Um, it's possible to put the venting machinery uh, in an attic to get the noise out of the space if you don't like it. Uh, but putting these things in is really important. And then using them is even more important. So what are the options for insulation? This is a really complicated question when you're dealing with a historic house because some materials are more appropriate than others to historic houses and which ones are the right ones for a given house really can depend on what the starting point is and what other work needs to be done to the house. Most modern insulating materials have been produced with new construction in mind. And with new construction, it is possible to install a plastic vapor barrier on the interior behind the wall surface that completely keeps moisture from penetrating into the walls from the interior. And that can allow different uses of insulation than what you have in a historic house. There's also the issue of reversibility, which in a historic building should be a priority, that you don't wanna do anything that can't be easily undone if you need to get access to the historic framing or if a better material comes along in 20 years and it would, you know, you wanna get out what's in there. So, this chart um, is a little difficult to talk about briefly, but it looks at uh, different types of commonly used insulation material today. Dense pack cellulose, standard pack cellulose, blown fiberglass, blown mineral wool or rock sole, mineral wool bats, fiberglass bats, open cell foam, closed cell foam, and rigid polyurethane foam. And then it looks at the uh, things to consider in using each. One is how much fabric has to be disturbed to install the product. Is it reversible? Is it vapor permeable? Does it help with air sealing? What is the R value per inch? That is the, how well does it insulate? And then what is its cost to the environment, both in its fabrication uh, or production and use? And if you 
And so this chart scores each of these types of insulation against each of these uh, considerations. And if you look at it, you see that the materials that can be blown in with minimal disturbance to the structure uh, score very well. And others that um, require more uh, destruction or had a, have a, a slightly higher environmental cost, score a bit lower. And then the ones that are require uh, removing a lot of historic fabric and have a higher environmental cost, uh, score the worst. So if you've got uh, a house with plaster walls that are in good or repairable condition, it never makes sense to rip out all of that plaster just to insulate your side walls. The vast majority of heat loss, as I've mentioned, is through the roof. The biggest issue in comfort is from drafts, and that's addressed best with air sealing. Um, when I was studying renovation technology at the Southern Maine Vocational Technical College in 1985, um, <clears throat> the professor walked through an analysis of where the bang for the buck was on insulating a building or the building we were working with, which was the Victorian row house. Uh, and <clears throat> His calculation was that only 3% of the heat loss was happening through the exterior walls. Uh, so to destroy intact interior materials, to get rid of 3% of your heat loss just doesn't make sense. However, if you've got to open up a wall to address structural issues or uh, if the plaster is already gone or so far gone it can't be saved, then it, it may be more reasonable to put in uh, an appropriate insulation material in that wall because it's a relatively low cost to just add it while this other work is taking place. So there is no one answer for what is the right insulation material for every house. It's really about this house in these conditions and where, where the most bang for the buck will come. And again, I'll go back to the energy audit is where you start to get the information you need to determine where, where is the best and what is the best for, uh, insulation in a historic house. Let's see if I can get this to switch slides. Is that up? There we go. So um, looking at different options, um, we're going to start with two of the most common, uh, cellulose, which is a recycled newspaper material with um, additives to reduce the fire risk and its appeal to uh, bugs and, and critters, uh, and fiberglass bat. Um, cellulose ranks very highly uh, in my chart because it's installed through little tiny holes, uh, whether in the exterior or the interior, and it can be packed very densely to reduce air infiltration, um, and it has a relatively good R value. Fiberglass bats are very common in new construction. In historic houses, they require complete removal of interior finishes, and they don't do a particularly good job 
of air sealing where they meet uh, the framing members or each other. And you can see the gaps where these pieces meet up. Those are all opportunities for air infiltration. Spray foam, and to my mind, is really only appropriate for new construction where an effective poly vapor barrier can be installed over the entire interior surface to keep moisture out of it uh, because uh, either closed cell or open cell foam has the potential to trap moisture in the wall where it will attack the framing, it will lead to rot, it will cause other problems. So to my mind, this material is best used in new construction or potentially in basements and cellars where it can be sprayed onto a, a drainage mat that is suspended over the stone or brick wall. So it, it can be removed without having any effect on the wall if that wall needs to be accessed for repair or other issues. Uh, here on the right, we have mineral wool. Uh, Roxel is the most uh, common brand here in New England. Uh, this is made from an industrial waste material. It is really the only insulation material that can get soaking wet and not be damaged or lose its insulating ability. Um, and it will dry out if, if it's allowed to dry out and doesn't have to be replaced. And cellulose, fiberglass, uh, the, and other fiber materials, if they get wet, essentially they've got to come out and be replaced. So this uh, is a material that's becoming more popular and uh, I think is in a situation where the wall was exposed anyway, um, it can be a good choice, certainly better than fiberglass bats. Uh, rigid foam has its applications. Uh, here it's being used in a brick garage that's being converted to a residential unit. Um, so the original masonry walls were uninsulated and uh, the rigid foam was applied to the interior of the brick and then a thin stud wall was placed inside it to run electrical and then a, a finished wall surface um, drywall in this case was applied and they left the, uh, the brick above the window and the chimney exposed for some character. Uh, so th this is an appropriate use for this material. Um, there are concerns with insulating masonry walls and there, theoretically uh, insulating a masonry wall can move the dew point into the wall in a way that will cause water to uh, accumulate in the wall and cause structural issues. Um, the thinking being that historically heat passed through these walls and moved the moisture out to the exterior. And this would be moisture that is absorbed into the brick or stone from rain or snow on the exterior. It's not really talking so much about moisture migrating out through. Um, and the concern is that if you insulate that wall so heat no longer moves through it, uh, you're gonna end up with too much moisture in the wall and possibly liquid water. Uh, the National Park Service has looked at this question closely because this comes up in historic tax credit rehab projects quite often. Um, here in Maine, we do a lot of projects that combine historic tax credits with low income housing tax credits and Maine State Housing has very strict efficiency standards that have to be met for the use of the low income housing credits. 
National Park Service has standards that have to be met for retaining the integrity and character of the building. So in analyzing the effect of insulating exterior walls in a masonry structure, the National Park Service has, has determined that it is an acceptable practice and that the theoretical risk of moving the dew point into the wall uh, has not been shown to actually happen and produce issues because moisture that migrates into the wall from the exterior can also migrate out. Um, and that's when the sun hits the wall or the outside temperature gets warmer, the moisture is drawn out. Uh, so the Park Service conclusion is that this is not a critical issue. Others feel differently. Um, I would encourage anyone who's considering this question to do additional research and determine what's the right answer to you. And then on the right here, we're looking at a product that's made from recycled cotton fiber. So again, a recycled material has a lower environmental cost to its production. Um, and it's, it's got a relatively good R value. But again, you have to completely remove the interior surfaces to install it. So we're going to look at a hybrid approach that was used in this attic of an 1850s house. When built, the house had three by seven rafters on approximately 30 to 32 inch centers uh, with some variation. In the 1980s, um, the roof framing was beefed up with two by tens installed between the original rafters uh, and the plaster cap for these attic bedrooms was removed at that time, uh, leaving the framing fully exposed. The approach taken to insulate this uh, attic is to and I'll try to walk through this because it's fairly complicated. So I'll start with, here's our original three by seven rafter, uh, and then the two by 10 rafter that's got uh, more depth here. Um, that difference between the two allowed two inch rigid foam to be installed between the 1980s rafters and running right over the 1850s rafters. Behind that, dense packed cellulose filled the seven inch gap of the original rafter depth. Inside of the rigid foam, one by three strapping was applied horizontally attached to the two by 10 rafters and then uh, gypsum board for skim coat plaster was installed inside of that, creating a dead air space that provides a bit more insulation. Um, because that original rafter depth was filled completely with the dense pack cellulose, a new approach to ventilating uh, the roof needed to be uh, worked out. So two by four sleepers were installed on the outside of the original roof sheathing with a new layer of sheathing and roofing on top of that, working with a ventilated drip edge and a ventilated ridge cap that allows air to flow up through on the outside of the original roof sheathing. Um, so that ventilates the roof. This uh, was a very effective approach. It allowed this uh, 1850s roof to achieve an R value that would be acceptable for new construction in most areas today. Um, so it doesn't have to be a single material that you use, but what it has to do 
is makes sense for the building that you're working with. So here is this uh, in process. You can see on the upper left, the uh, rigid foam has been installed between the 1980s rafters, hiding the 1850s rafters, and the strapping has been applied over it. Um, the rigid foam was not carried across the ceiling because uh, we didn't want to lose any more headroom than necessary. And we had more space to put the cellulose insulation on top to get the R value we needed in that area. So uh, once this was done, the drywall was installed. Uh, again, this is going to be receiving a skim coat of plaster to have a more historic appearance when the room is finished. Once that was installed, uh, a little hole was cut on one end um, where you see this red arrow and a worker um, pulling a hose crawled up in there all the way to the other end of the house in the little triangle above the ceiling and then inserted the hose down the base on one side, then the other, filling with dense pack cellulose as he worked his way back toward his access hole, uh, and then filling on top of the ceiling as he went. And so by the time he got back to the access hole and got down through it, the entire ceiling and angled portions of the ceiling were full of dense pack cellulose outside of the rigid foam and on top of the ceiling. And then uh, a, a patch was screwed in place with a little hole in it for filling the remaining area where he had just come down through. Um, it produced a very effective roof and cap for, for this house. A more typical approach uh, in a situation like this is, again, you, you need your ventilation uh, either through gable vents or eave vents uh, that runs from the eave to the tip of the gable. And then often uh, for this, you will insulate the outside of the knee wall the ceiling uh, or the floor and the ceiling at the eaves and then on top of here. And then hopefully you can get some insulation into the angle as well, though uh, it can be tricky if you've got intact materials here. Um, if this is done correctly, any form of insulation and ventilation is done correctly on a roof in this climate, you will eliminate the risk of ice dams. Um, that is some, an important consideration when you're considering, is it worth the effort and cost to insulate and ventilate? Um, if you can prevent ice dams and all of the damage they cause, that can definitely tip <laughs> tip the scale in favor of doing this work. Okay, so we've focused on insulating and ventilating, but we can't really talk about this topic without at least briefly touching on doors and windows because they're such an important part of the envelope of a building. What you're seeing here is the ice crystals that formed on the interior face of a storm window because the historic primary window was loose enough to allow moist interior air into the space between them where it condensed on the cold storm window and formed these ice crystals. This is a clear sign that the interior window could use some tightening. Um, some basics on historic wood windows. A single glazed window with a storm window, either interior or exterior, is as efficient as a new double glazed window. Historic wood windows are repairable and nearly all modern windows are not. 
new weather stripping can be installed on historic doors and windows. Full rehab is not the only option for improving historic wood windows. And we'll talk about that a little bit in a second. Curtains and blinds are very effective for reducing heat loss in winter or heat gain in summer. Wood storm windows are still being made as is the hardware to hang them so that they can be opened partially in summer. Wood storm doors are more effective than aluminum uh, if they're properly weather stripped. There are low profile aluminum storms for the exterior that are not very visible. And the old mill finish or raw aluminum storm windows that we're all familiar with can be painted to reduce their visibility. This photo shows uh, two windows in a bedroom on a cool fall morning. The window on the left has not been touched. The window on the right has been tightened up with about $5 in weather stripping and an hour to an hour and a half of effort. And you can see the dr dramatic difference. And this goes back to that uh, moist air condensing on a cold storm window because it gets around a loose interior window. And this is the dramatic difference that can be accomplished with a relatively small investment of time and a, a really small investment of money. And in this case, what we're looking at is a vinyl bulb weather strip installed at the meeting rail and the bottom rail in a, a folded V vinyl weather strip installed along the edges where the window moves. Uh, basic tools, a little bit of time. And this is not equivalent to a full window rehab with bronze weather stripping that will last 100 years. Um, th this particular window we're looking at is in my house. Uh, I did it about 10 years ago. Um, the windows that get used the most are ready to be redone because these inexpensive materials have lasted about 10 years. Uh, but at $5 a window, I, I'm feeling that that was a worthwhile investment for 10 years of tight windows. Um, if I had the budget, every window in the house would be fully rehabbed by a professional and get good bronze weather stripping uh, to be good for the next century. Uh, and that day may come. But in the meantime, this has made an enormous difference both in comfort and the cost to heat the house. Uh, here's an example of a historic wood storm um, still in use on this house. On the right, uh, there are low profile modern exterior storm windows from Allied installed, and you can see that they really are not noticeable. If you've got historic interior shutters, they are really effective for helping with these issues. Often uh, the folding shutter type that you see on the right has been painted in place and it isn't really apparent that they are shutters. Uh, but if you look uh, for a painted over hinge, uh, that's usually a giveaway that there are actually shutters there that can be returned to functionality. One uh, storm door solution I really like was used on this wonderful federal style house where they simply replicated the original wood door and installed the storm door opening out while the historic door remains in place opening in. And in summer, this door is taken off and a screen door with matching hinges is just swapped out for it by pulling the hinge pins and changing them. And when the storm door is in place, the appearance of the house really is unchanged, um, unless you happen to notice that it's hinged to open out rather than in as most exterior doors do.
Scott, just your few minute warning here. So I just want to make sure we have time sure. to and we're, some of the questions. We're pretty much through. Um, again, I need to just mention that improvements to HVAC equipment um, are important. There are some real do's and don'ts. Don't do things that really have a strong visual impact on the exterior and where you need to install equipment, do things like paint it out so it just blends in and doesn't call attention to itself. Um, I'll very quickly just flip through this case study showing uh, the old hot air furnace being replaced by a new high efficiency gas boiler for a radiant heat system in a historic house. Um, and an example of how far you can go. This was a, a deep energy retrofit case study done with a federal grant to see how efficient this Victorian cottage could be made. As you can see, it was in terrible condition. Um, the, the, this project went to the extreme, um, taking off exterior siding and trim, building out the walls two inches with insulation and reinstalling the historic materials. Same with uh, adjusting the roof height to add exterior insulation at the roof, an enormous amount of air sealing, and then careful detailing so these changes were not visible. Uh, some before and afters. This is what I really want to get to because this analysis was done of where the efficiency savings came from on this project. And we see that 51% came from air sealing. Um, most people don't realize the importance of air sealing in making a building energy efficient and comfortable. Insulation contributed 21%, an improved HVAC system, 15%, CFL lighting was 8%, and very, very expensive triple glazed windows only contributed 5% to the improved efficiency of the building, which means the payback period on those windows is never going to actually work in a real life, non-federal grant funded project. So, and here's that cottage after when the project was nearly complete. Um, I'm gonna do a quick plug for my book, Restoring Your Historic House. Um, it, uh, 700 plus pages based on 40 years experience. These topics are all covered in depth in the book. Um, my wonderful co-worker, co Dave Clough, did uh, the uh, featured house photos for the book. Here's one of those. Uh, the book is broken down with project planning, under the surface, systems, the exterior envelope, interior finishes, tools and resources, and, uh, and insulating, ventilating, windows, doors, HVAC, it's all covered in depth in the book. Uh, so I will just get to here to mention that for today's event, um, I've created a $5 off coupon for any purchase from my website, yourhistorichouse.com. Um, so you can use it on restoring your historic house or another book I really recommend for this topic in particular is this one, Michael Litchfield's Renovation, A Complete Guide. It is not specific to historic houses, but it is the best basic volume on the topic I know of. And uh, it is available as a combo pack with my book on the website. Uh, so you can save some money as a combo and use the coupon on top of that. The code is NHPA5 and it will be good until October 5th. 
And with that, I am happy to take any questions you have. And I know Beverly wants to also thank our sponsors. I do. And thank you so much, Scott. Great information here. I wish we had two hours because we could easily mm -hmm. fill two hours. Um, but as Scott mentioned, his book is fabulous. It's probably the biggest preservation book you'll ever own, thickest. Um, wonderful book. But before I close, I do want to address some of these questions. And because we're um, running tight with our time, um, we will be doing the additional 15 minutes afterwards. But I want to get this all wrapped up by one for those people who are on a very tight schedule. So let's go to some of the questions because there were some great questions here. Um, first one being, I have an 18th century home which needs extensive restoration. What do you think about adding insulation to the outside of the house while the wood siding is off and then replacing the siding? Uh, then, as I, I just showed in that case study with the Victorian worker cottage, this can be done and done in a way that has minimal impact to the historic character of the house. It's all about how you detail the trim and the eaves and disguise the fact that you have actually made the house a little bit bigger. Um, but it, it certainly can be done if you're stripping the house anyway. I, I wouldn't recommend it um, for a house that didn't need to be stripped to begin with because you're just not gaining that much uh, insulation or cost savings from sidewall insulation. Okay, thank you. Another one, do you have a trick to screening windows with wood storm windows? I think um, there are a couple of approaches to that. Uh, I think the most traditional is to simply make a wood frame screen that sets under the upper sash. Um, and usually they're held in with little hooks or clips. Um, and they go in when the wood sash comes out. Uh, or if it's a, a hinged exterior storm that swings out, you know, six inches, you install the screen uh, from the interior. The other option that, um, that I, I like, uh, because they're, they're just very easy to use, are the old um, adjustable screens that it's a freestanding unit that you can adjust its width. They're usually yay high. Um, I have a bunch in my house that probably date from, you know, the 1930s uh, that we still, you know, we've got a couple windows that don't have exterior screens and we still use those and they work very well. And I, I just want to point out to be careful if you have young kids or animals that want to push. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah. All right. Here's an interesting question from somebody, I think, in Los Angeles. Welcome to the program if you're calling from Los Angeles. Um, yes. Would doing rigid insulation on the exterior of a roof be a reasonable approach in LA? Uh, again, it's about the detailing. Um, when we use exterior roof insulation on historic tax credit projects, uh, it's usually done with a very low slope or flat roof, and then it's tapered at the edge. So when you look up at the building, you don't suddenly have a very thick eave. Um, the other uh, way to do that, if you need to deal with that thickness, um, is as it was done in that worker cottage where uh, the, how can I describe this quickly? Um, the insulation became added to the height of the wall with the part that projects out looking exactly as it did six inches lower. Um, and there are drawings of that in that case study, which is in the book. Okay, great. And we'll do one more before we do the closing comments. Circa 1790 Colonial with almost I think they mean no insulation, probably looking to insulate from exterior to preserve the interior split lath walls and features. Thoughts on spray spray on vapor barriers, example, Stowgard. Um, I have yet to see that 
be done in a way that is truly effective. And my recommendation would be to focus your efforts on the cap and air infiltration and, and insulation around the foundation, air seal your walls and windows and doors, and don't, don't worry about that 3% of your heat loss through the sidewalls. Um, it's gonna be a huge investment for a very, very small return. Okay, great, thank you. And at this time, I'm going to do my closing comments, but we will stay on for an additional 15 minutes. Um, remember, today we are recording, so if you have to leave and your, answer, your question wasn't answered, I'll be sending out the link to the recording so you can hear the answer. So at this time, I just want to again thank Scott so much for this wonderful presentation. There's so much great information here. As I said, we could go on and on, and this is probably one of the topics I get the most questions on um, relating to how to make my house more energy efficient, weather tight, especially this time of the year. Um, thoughtful and experienced presenters like Scott and your great questions and involvement make a huge impact on advancing preservation efforts across New Hampshire. We want you to know the Alliance is here to help and encourage you to check out our website, nhpreservation.org, or send us an email to bt at nhpreservation.org at any time with questions. Um, our next expo program will be Solar Strategies for Older Buildings, and that will be next Wednesday, October 6th at Sanborn Mills Farm in Loudoun, so that's an in-person expo program. Revision Energies, Travis Jenna Tosio will offer a tour of the 193 solar panels that were installed at the farm to offset 100% of their electrical needs. Stay tuned to our website calendar for more information on that and other upcoming programs. And we encourage you to share our Expo website link with other old house and barn enthusiasts. And be sure to check out our Expo guide to 50 products and service providers on the Expo page of the website. So at this time, um, we'd like to announce the door prize winner as our token of appreciation for you to join today. And I will turn it over to my colleague, Maggie Steer, to pick, pick today's lucky winner of a one-year membership in the Preservation Alliance or an additional year if you are already a current member. So Maggie, who's the lucky winner? The lucky winner is Martha German. Oh. Thank you. Are you there? Yes. She's here. Okay, good. I'm excited. I'm, I'm in Connecticut. <laughs> I don't know whether uh, that disqualifies me. <laughs> I think you'll find that the Preservation Alliance has a lot of useful knowledge and programs that you can take advantage of. And I certainly so good it. about helping New Hampshire Preservation Alliance. Yeah, we welcome all. Thank you for joining today, Martha. Thank you so much. And I enjoyed last week's program too. <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. They're wonderful. I, I really, really appreciate what you're offering to us. Great. Thanks for joining, Martha. Thank you. All right. So as I had said, I'll be sending up a follow, follow up email to everybody who's participating today with the link to this recording and other resources. And in that will include Scott's um, website, coupon code, all the details on how you get can get in touch with him or purchase his book. Um, again, thanks to Scott for joining us today for his second Expo on the Road presentation. To our Old House and Barn sponsors, Scott, can you advance the slide just so we can see our sponsors? Oh, yes. And to all of you who are supporters of our critical work that help advance preservation efforts around New Hampshire. Um, and please help keep the Preservation Alliance vibrant by making a donation or considering a gift membership. We wish you all well and thank you for joining today and hope to see you at future programs. And for those who would like to stay on, please do so and we will continue the Q&A for another 15 minutes. Okay, let's go to the next question. Any tips, Scott, on introducing air conditioning to old houses? especially timber frame old houses? Um, this, this, of course, is becoming a question that is more frequently considered here in northern New England um, as uh, our 
climate is changing and we're dealing with more intense or, or more extended periods of intense heat during the summer. Um, uh, uh, this is related to today's topic, but really a, a different topic. Um, and the insulation and ventilation improves the efficiency of air conditioning. Uh, but in terms of what systems work for historic houses, it's going to depend a lot on, as I say again and again, what your starting point is. If you have an existing forced hot air system, it might be most effective to do a, a whole house AC system that uses the same ductwork. Um, if you don't have existing ductwork, uh, it is generally difficult and expensive to introduce it into a historic house without impacting uh, finished surfaces and spaces. Uh, sometimes you can use closets and chimney chases and you know other places to get the ductwork up through the house without a lot of impact, but there's a significant cost to doing that in a way that is not is you know readily visible. Um, so if you don't have existing ductwork, that type of whole house system may not be the best approach. There are systems that use small tubing that can be snaked through walls and ceilings. Um, the Unico system is probably the best known. Um, and that can be a good solution for historic houses. You'll often find that used in historic house museums uh, where they really, the emphasis is on minimizing the visual impact but um, for instance, uh, Abraham Lincoln's summer cottage outside Washington uh, in a climate where air conditioning really is needed to protect the building in the humid summers and to make it comfortable for visitors, they use the Unico system. Uh, and then there are the mini split um, heat pump. Uh, units and that also can be effective but it's about how do you locate the equipment so it has the least impact on the character of the space there are uh, ceiling mounted uh, heads for mini split systems so you don't have to have the big ugly plastic box um, mounted to the wall um, or you can mount that in a way where it's not hugely visible, like over the door that's the primary entrance to a room. You're not, it's not going to be super noticeable. And those are great because you can get heat and AC efficiently using a heat pump, which should be carefully hidden on the exterior, not mounted to the front of the house. Um, and you can use screening with vegetation or fencing or just locate it in a location. Do not run tubing across the exterior of the house with a plastic shield over it. Um, that tubing can be run through basements and attics and in walls and be kept out of sight. So there are a variety of approaches and the right one for a given house is really about what are the conditions of that house? There's a long answer to a short question. Okay, thank you, thank you. And this is a question of mine that I would love for you to touch on that relates to everything we're talking about here. Advice on finding the right contractor to do this quality work instead of sticking things on the outside when they shouldn't be there and that kind of stuff. Great question. and. Um, <laughs> where to find the right contractors to do work on historic houses is probably the question I get most often on my social media accounts and the website. And my first recommendation is always to touch base with your local or state historic preservation organization, because most of them maintain directories or lists of contractors who are experienced in working with historic buildings. And um, other, al 
alternatives are to talk to friends or neighbors who've had similar work done and find out what their experience was. And, um, and you may learn that that's the contractor you don't want, but learn mm -hmm. from other people's experience. Um, and sometimes the State Historic Preservation Office also maintains a list of uh, contractors who've done work that they're aware of that was done. Okay. Great, and I want to put in a plug for our, we do have a directory of preservation products and services um, on our website. I will include that in the post event email, but I also want to say, don't feel shy about questioning your contractor if you think Absolutely. they're doing something wrong or something you don't want them to do. Yeah, always get references, talk to the people they've done work for. If they don't want to tell you who they've done work for, take that as a warning. Yeah, okay. Couple more questions here. Recommendation or recommended insulation for underside of the floor of a, in a crawl space. Solution to moisture barrier. These are two separate questions for dry laid stone foundation. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, and the moisture barrier is the first step in undertaking this effort. Uh, you need to stop the moisture that's coming up through the soil. Um, and, uh, and that's just a heavy poly barrier with every seam solidly taped and attached to the foundation. And if there's a lot of uh, air infiltration through that foundation and potential moisture coming through it, uh, you'll need to address that too, um, either by running that barrier up to the sills um, or doing another tre treatment to um, address the foundation. Sometimes it is possible to insulate the foundation so you don't have to insulate the floor. And uh, that would be, you know, installing drainage mat that hangs from the wood sills and doing a spray foam on to the drainage mat that would seal to your vapor barrier. Scott, is um, that discussed in your book? Yes, it is. Okay. So, uh, but deal with the moisture and then either insulate the foundation or the underside of the floor. Once the moisture is dealt with, you've got a lot of options for insulation materials to do that with if you're doing the floor. Okay, great. Here's another really good question. Um, she's asking whether you would recommend redoing the blown in insulation that has gotten wet over the years, filled with mouse tunnels, and ice dams have been a problem in her yes. 1790s cape. Yes. <laughs> that's an easy one, right? Yes. And she's lucky that it's blown in because that's easy to get out, right? Yeah. And, and I, I've removed lots of blown in insulation. You want, if you're doing it yourself, you need a respirator. Um, and I protection. It's nasty, particularly if it's had rodents in it, um, but it's not difficult to do. And uh, there's a photo in, in the book of me um, fully suited up uh, using a plastic dust bin and contractor trash bags to, you know, scoop it out and then going in with a shop vac to get what remains. Uh, not hard, but not pleasant. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And one last question. I've heard high velocity units are loud. I think talking about the. Yeah, that's the AC. Like the, the AC um, small duct work. Um, I'm told that this issue has been addressed by many of the manufacturers through tweaks to uh, the design of the tubing and the heads and, um, uh, but I have not, uh, I don't have firsthand experience other than the fact that I've been in a number of rooms using these systems where I have not heard them. Um, okay. So, Good so I, that 
gives me confidence that the companies who claim they've dealt with the issue probably have. Um, because if, if I'm not noticing it and I hate mechanical noises, um, <laughs> then, then chances are that they, they have been successful in that. But uh, if you're considering a particular company, ask to visit a recent installation mm -hmm. and, and check it out for yourself. Um, and I will make that recommendation for any claim by any manufacturer on any product. <laughs> Check it for yourself. Um, great advice, great advice. Okay, I think we've answered all the questions except this one last question about a window restoration workshop that I guess I had thought we'd be able to do this year, but we have not because of COVID restrictions. So if all goes well, we will be doing one next year. We usually do one a year and just it's been tough with COVID. So no, I do not have one scheduled at this time. But thanks for asking the question, Diane. All right, so I'm sensitive. It's now past 1:15. I'm sensitive to Scott's time. Um, again, I want to thank Scott so much for joining us for his second time. His presentations are always very well um, attended, and he's got great information. Again, I will put all his information out in the post-event email that should be going out tomorrow or the next day. And I want to thank all of you for joining. So take care, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.